The problem with this story is that we've all read it and heard it so often, it loses its punch. It's a very punchy story. Now, about eight days after this had been said, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the aspect of his face was changed and his clothing became brilliant as lightning. Suddenly there were two men there talking to him. They were Moses and Elijah appearing in glory and they were speaking of his passing which he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were heavy with sleep but they kept awake and saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't really know what he was saying. And as he spoke, a cloud came and covered them with a shadow. And when they went into the cloud, the disciples were terrified, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. And after the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. The disciples kept silence and at that time told no one what they had seen. This story was um, vastly more important in the early couple of hundred years of the church than it is now. Now we have the sort of feast day of the transfiguration. We read the story. You know, the early church used this story as one of the grids to understand Christian discipleship, spirituality, who Jesus was, where we're going after we die. It was a really big news story. Now, I want to try and paint a little picture for you of this story. Peter is utterly stupefied. So are the rest. Peter gets words out, but they aren't of any value to anyone. They're pretty senseless, and he's, you know, he's, he's just dribbling whatever comes out because he's utterly destroyed. He's shredded by this experience. Think of it. Medieval art, and you know, even now you'll see, you know, if you go to artworks for transfiguration, you'll see this lovely golden glow on the face of Jesus. And it's very pretty. It's very nice. It's got a light quaff in his hair. It's not what the Bible says. It said, he shone like lightning. Have any of you stood close, you know, 30 feet away from a lightning bolt? I know you haven't because you'd be blind if you had. It's a terrifyingly powerful magnesium flare sort of brightness that's coming off Jesus. It's utterly, ter that's terrifying in its own right, okay? Then a cloud comes down. Obviously, this is the Shekinah cloud, the glory of God. That cloud turned 600,000 people into a quivering mess who looked at Moses and said, you go into that thing, no way, no, no, we. Anybody goes near that cloud is probably going to die. That's a unanimous verdict. 600,000, well, it's not quite unanimous, 600,000 versus one. That's the cloud that falls. Moses went into the cloud. He came out shining just from being in it. And then out of the cloud, a voice speaks. The voice of the Father. First time we hear that voice. What's the first time we hear that voice speak? What's it say? Genesis chapter 1, if you need a big clue. Let there be light. And the astrophysicists are still tracking that bird. Isn't it huge? They think they're going to be able to see the big bag. Oh, I can't wait. Sorry. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. All the big bang is is scientific code for let there be light. And out of that word comes this phenomenal out of nothing explosion that casts galaxies forward and some guys believe that this creation is still in process moving at an infinite rate in every direction through the cosmos and this is the love of God creating it's just it's still exploding God never stops saying let there be light it's just going on that's the voice that spoke out of the cloud now how would you like to have tickets to that little show a man like lightning the Shekinah glory of God and the very voice of the Father. There are no words to paint the power of this picture. There is no art that can do it. It's flat out terrifying. And the reaction of the disciples sums it up just nicely. Oh, oh, you want to build a tent? <laughs> they didn't know what to say. No one would. And that's, that's where this story um, starts. 
I, it's as usual with the gospel stories, there's, there's so much in it. I'd love to do a, a, a little, you know, half an hour meditation on what did this story mean for Moses and Elijah? Think about it. Their ministries were pointing towards Christ. And here they are, standing. They've been sent by the Father to encourage him and strengthen the man, Jesus. He's not only the Son of God, he's, he's our bloke too, who is about to die under torture, utterly abandoned, and the only man in the history of the world absolutely condemned to hell. That's a, that's a big gig, you know? That's really horrible. Jesus is going to sweat blood. Even after this experience of encouragement, he's going to go to the garden and sweat blood and plead for any other way than this. And in the transfiguration, the father is coming to him and he's saying, son, I've sent Moses and Elijah. They've been getting this thing ready for 2,000 years. We have to do this, son. Have you ever wanted to look at your kids, you know, in my terms and say, hey, kid, you're a smith. That means something. That's what the Father's doing to Jesus here. He's saying, hey, kid, you're Trinity. That means something. This is my son. I'm proud of you, son. You're doing well. You're on track. It's horrible, and it's hard, and it has to happen, and I need you to do it, and I'm proud as punch of you. And just for a minute, I'm going to show your mates what you really look like. We'll take the veil away just for a little bit, for a little second. It's hugely encouraging to Jesus. It's meant to be very encouraging for the disciples. Think about it. What's just happened? The eight days before? Hey, by the way, time stamps in the Bible are really unusual in the Gospels. Really unusual. And I think Luke understood how utterly unbelievable this story is. How utterly implausible, how totally ridiculous this story is. And so have you noticed he puts two time stamps on it? Eight days after... Peter declared Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Eight days after that, this actually happened. And then the epileptic demoniac in the next story, one day after that, he went down and cast out. Remember that demon? It was a day before that. And Luke, I think, is at pains to say, this is absolutely fair income. It absolutely happened. It's not some resurrection appearance that got bumped forward in the story somehow. This really, really happened. And it was really, really meant for that voice to say, among others, to Peter, listen to Jesus. You know, Jesus said, Peter, who do you think I am? He said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. What's the next thing that Jesus says to him? Good work. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father revealed that to you. And if I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'm about to go and die on a cross. I'm going to take curses to myself. I'm going to be tortured, beaten, criminal. Ah! And Peter looks at Jesus and in, in English words of today says, over my dead body, Jesus looks back at him and said, be very careful what you say, Peter. It may come to that. In fact, when you were young, you went wherever you want. But when you're old, they'll tie your hands and they'll take you exactly where you don't want. So sit down, shut up, take notes, get behind me, Satan. This is on. The disciples can't cope with that. You're the Messiah. You're going to die? What? Brain snaps. And so God gives them this experience to say, listen to him. It's real. There is glory in Jesus. You are quite right. He is my son. He must die. Listen to him. So it's an encouragement for them. And it's this, this powerful, powerful thing. St. John reflects on this a lot in his Gospels and in his letters. He got to see this twice, you remember. Once now, and he had some little preparation when on the island of Patmos, heaven opened and he saw the Son of Man. You know, the guy with the lightning bolt clothes. Hey, I know who you are. <laughs> I've been here before. And the book of Revelation opens up in majesty. So that's, that's the story. Now, Peter, at the time, says nothing, has no grid for it, is utterly destroyed by it, doesn't get it, frankly, leaves the scene, and we know his performance and track record over the course of the crucifixion. He doesn't exactly shine, even with this experience. And in fact, um, two stories after this is the story of a, a, an eruption among the disciples and they were arguing about who, who was the best. I almost wonder if the transfiguration didn't spark that conversation. No, oh, yeah, Peter, James and John, they're the special ones. You know, they get, they get all the good, they get to go and hang out. You know, they get, we don't know what happened on that mountain, but look at them. You know, they're the favourites 
and an argument, I don't know, maybe it was the transfiguration that actually sparked that whole thing. Actually, and the other, oh, sorry, this is all Bible study stuff, but it's fun. Or at least I like it anyway, so you can just enjoy, you know, enjoy me enjoying it. Um, that verse about, um, I tell you solemnly, there are some who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. That is the verse before the story of the transfiguration. Is it possible that's what Jesus meant? And in the transfiguration, those guys actually saw the kingdom of God. I don't know. I, I just get tantalized by it. It's just fascinating. It's the verse before, it's almost like the heading. Some will not see death until they see the kingdom of God. Eight days after this, Jesus went up to a mountain. I don't know. I, I don't know. But it's a fun thought. Look, that's the, um, that's the background to all this. What I want us to do, though, this morning is to go over to Second Peter and spend some time there. Because Peter did reflect on this. And Peter came to understand the faith through this experience. Now I need to make a little confession before we start. I'm on a little journey spiritually at the moment and this stuff is right at the heart of it. So this is sort of somewhere between testimony and preaching and the problem when you've got a preacher who's really excited about something, it'll often sound like drivel because he's just raving and you're going, what? Uh, so if that happens, I'll just apologise in advance. If I start dribbling too much, go and get coffee, chat among yourselves, all right? Um, I hope, I, I hope uh, there'll be some blessing in this for you. Now, Peter, as I said, took the transfiguration as his grid for how to live the Christian life. He came to see our identity through that grid. He came to see the reality of our service and the call to take up our cross and follow Jesus through the grid of this experience. And he came to see the hope of glory through this experience. And John goes even further in his, his letter. I think it's chapter one, uh, 1 John 3, 2. He talks about, you know, when he appears, we will see him in his glory. We don't know what we'll look like, but we'll be like him in his glory. So they really worked this angle. And in Second um, Peter chapter 1, you get Peter's working over it. We're going to read 2 to 9 and then 16 to 18. The only reason we're going to leave out the other stuff is because we don't have time. In, um, oh well, in verse 14, Peter explains his purpose in writing this. Uh, oh, I'll start a bit earlier. Verse, oh, verse 12. Well, I'm constantly recalling the same truths to you, even though you already know them and firmly hold them. I'm sure it is my duty as long as I live to keep stirring, up, stirring you up with reminders. Because I know the time of my death is soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has foretold to me. And I shall take great care that after my own departure, you will still have a means to recall these things to memory. This is like Peter's last will and testimony. He's saying, guys, I'll be dead pretty soon. And when I'm gone, I need you to remember the essence of what it is to walk with Christ. And we'll use the transfiguration to do it. So let's get started at, um, at, verse, two, at verse 3. Peter says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. That's one of my favorite verses of all time. Paul says that God has prepared a life of good works for us beforehand. There's a path there for us. And as we walk that path, we have everything we need to achieve it. There is so much comfort in that. So much comfort in that. Where God leads, he provides. So if you've got some great big vision of world evangelization like I do, and no possible means of achieving it. It probably means you're in the flesh and you're having a fantasy. God has given me what I need to do what he has called me to. Everything I need for life and for godliness. How's that? I have and you have everything we need for an intimate, powerful, sometimes explosive, often very quiet, frequently very mundane Walk with God now because God has given it to us. That's where Peter starts. And can you feel the comfort in that? It's ours. It's just, it's just sitting here. You just have to pick it up. 
back when I was starting my really stupid, radical adventures in ministry, um, David Collins. We, we were spending hours a day in prayer and we're wandering around the Palmetum in Townsville and David came back, he said, I've just seen a really weird vision. I said, what's that? He said, under every tree in the Palmetum, there's a box, a gift-wrapped box. There are gifts lying all around us. And the Lord said, work out how to open them. <laughs> and that's what our discipleship is. The gift is given. Work out how to open it. So that's where Peter starts. Very precious. He's brought us to know God himself. Hey, brought us to know God himself, who has called us by his glory and goodness. And in making these gifts, he's given us the guarantee of something very great and wonderful to come. The very great and wonderful to come. Just wonderful what's going to happen to us. Through them, you'll be able to share the divine nature. Now I'm going to go mystical on you here. Share the divine nature. If anybody wants to hazard a guess on how to put that into words, I'll take it. That's transfiguration level confusion. Participating in the divine nature. Um, as he is, so we shall be in this world. It's no longer I that live, it's Christ who lives in me. Uh, John 17, Father, that we may be one, that they may be one with us as I'm one with you, that we will just share a heartbeat, share a mind. You know, Paul, we have the mind of Christ. <sighs> have any of you ever really meditated on that? I've tried. And I, I got about two inches, I reckon. I am a participator in the nature of God. That should be, you should all be just on your knees going, whoa, great one. <laughs> Even for me to say that. But here's the thing. You too. That's what Peter's saying our lives are. We are participators in the divine nature. Wow. Through this, you'll be able to share the divine nature and escape corruption in a world that's sunk in vice. So no matter how alluring the world is and how much our own flesh reaches out to that world and said, I really like that, I've got to get me some of that. No matter how much that happens, as we have this unity with Christ and share in his nature, we'll be safe from it. We will be that holy people, the royal priesthood, the people set apart to sing the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. So that's the gift. That's where Peter starts. He said, this is the gift that we have. It's yours. It's now. You don't do anything. It's, and even if, you don't, if you're not aware of it, if this is news to you, doesn't matter. It's actually given. There's a Ferrari parked outside. It's got your name on it. Here are the keys. And then he says, who wants to learn to drive? These are the gifts. But, in verse 5, to attain this, to actually really walk in this, you'll have to do your utmost yourselves. Adding goodness to the faith that you have. And then add understanding to your goodness. Add self-control. Add patience. True devotion. Kindness towards your fellow men. And, and, and after all that, the big one, love. You've got to do that stuff if you want to get the gift. How do we get those boxes unpacked under the trees? How do we take this gift to attain it? You've got to do your utmost. You've got stuff to do. And he gives that list. I've actually run a discipleship course for an entire year out of those two verses. You know, add this, add this, add this, add this. And you know my real regret about that course? We didn't get back into the first part about the gift. It was a great personal development course. And people were helped and changed. And you, know, and, and you add true devotion, you do that stuff, you get on the road, you find your devotion increases. There were wonderful things happened. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. There were healings, there were miracles. It was glorious. I just wish we'd spent more time in the real glorious stuff. To be partakers of the divine nature. Ugh. Everything we need, all that stuff. So a great gift, but you've got work to do. Go down to verse 16. How do I know this and what is my grid for telling you this? 
It was not any cleverly invented myth that we're repeating when we brought you the knowledge of the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We had seen his glory for ourselves. He was honoured and glorified by God the Father when the sublime glory itself spoke to him and said, This is my son, the beloved. He enjoys my favour. We heard this ourselves, spoken from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter didn't do great at the time of the transfiguration. He didn't really listen to Christ. You know, they came to arrest him. He took a sword and started doing people damage. He didn't listen. They came out and, you know, and that, the girl came to him and said, hey, you were with Jesus and not on your sweet life, not me. Completely fell apart. But over the decades, he meditated it on and he said, you know, the transfiguration is great. We see the glory of God. We see what we will become. We see who Jesus is. We see that there is glory buried in the everyday. This Jesus bloke who we've kicked around with. We've seen his nose running. We've smelt his B.O. And you should see him when the glory shines out of him. And our lives are like that, are they not? <laughs> there are a couple, and I'm, I'm seeing a few of you nod. I reckon that all of, all of us, I hope all of us, have some marker moments spiritually. I remember once I was driving, I was young, I was coming back through Kempsey on my own in the old HT. Remember that car? Actually, you may not know that I had the HT that night. Um, okay, <laughs> this is really bad. <laughs> driving through Kempsey, through this forest on a bit of road that a lot of people died on because it was a dreadful piece of road. Trees everywhere, beautiful to look at. And the presence of God just came in the car. Just gloriously. And it was the sort of thing that I, I had up until that point only ever experienced when major miracles were about to break out. You know, when that happens, someone's going to get healed. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, what? <laughs> like, it's me and the car. What? And the voice said as clear as a bell, Mike, I just love you. What a, for me, that's an absolute marker moment. I mean, that's like high watermark for me of my walk with Christ. I would love to tell you that happens every single night. I am here to tell you I remember it so well because I haven't had anything like that since. And the transfiguration is like that. It's this marker moment that they can hang on to and, and you know your marker moments, yeah, you should not try to relive the past. That's what Peter's trying to do. We'll build booths, we'll stay here. Don't do that. It's a waste of time. But your marker moments, you know, you might have called it the day you got baptised in the Holy Spirit, the day you got saved, the day you got some revelation, the day God healed your body, whatever it is. It is meant to be something you can hang on to because sooner or later you're going to get out of that place, you're going to go down the hill and you're going to find an epileptic kid utterly demonised with a father who's completely at the end of his rope, can't cope anymore and comes to Jesus and says, please do something. I mean, you want to talk about a buzzkill. But for those days, those marker moments matter and they're a gift to you. And so Peter's saying to us, in you, you know, we, Paul says, we have this treasure buried in clay pots. It's there. And the transfiguration just shows us that's what Jesus was like. You're following Jesus. You're like that too. The glory is in you. The gift that is in you is staggering in its dimensions. But what I learned was, because I blew it, I came down, I denied Christ. Uh, I tried to kill people who were actually, in a perverse way, doing the will of God. What I learned was, that's the strength to walk the journey of faith and good works and patience and forgiveness and, and all that stuff. And the transfiguration became his grid for all of that. Where I'm at at the moment is, because St. John is really big on this, chapter 17 of John's Gospel, all that amazing stuff. And his hope for us, his final hope for us is that they may see my glory. You know what Jesus wants for you? He wants to sit down with you and say, hey, check this out! And light up like a lightning bolt and look like some supernatural high priest and some lamb who's been slain and, and just to say, look at this! This is who I really am and I just so much wanted to show you. That's what John 17 is saying. 
John, uh, 1 John 3 says, you know, we're going to become like him. What's the, you know, the fundamental will of God for your life? Fundamentally, that you should take on the nature and image of Christ. And it's glorious. It is so amazingly special. I'm doing some reading at the moment that has caught me up in quantum physics. Just said that so that you'd all think I'm really, really smart. But what they've found is quite bizarre. And if anybody knows anything about quantum physics, please forgive me because this is a real layman's view. What they've found is that at the tiniest, tiniest level of existence, there are these little things, they're not even really sure what to call them, that are sort of the, the absolute basis of matter. And they've found that some of these things just do the same thing at the same time. And if they are communicating and saying, why don't we do this next, they're doing it faster than the speed of light, and it's impossible to tell how they, they just do the same thing at the same time. And they, they're not close to each other, but these things just exactly mirror one another. And I'm using that as a real image to help me pray. Jesus is out there being Jesus. I'm down here. They call it entanglement. Yeah, so these are entangled particles. And I'm saying, Jesus, I want to be entangled with you. I want whatever's going on in your mind to go on in my mind. I want whatever's happening in your day to be happening in my day. And I want whatever's happening in my day to be happening in your day. And I want that to be happening. And I want this unity with you so that when people meet me, they'll see my face, but they'll know what I'm entangled with. They'll know that they're in the presence of Jesus. And I'd love to tell you I was there. I'm like St. Paul. Not that I have achieved this, <laughs> but this one thing I do. I forget how slack my discipleship has been, how easygoing my spirituality has been, how sinful my life has been, and I press forward to capture that prize. I found that. I was in the coffee club at Capalaba with a lovely Anglican brother this week. And I've done some stupid things and hurt myself. And my wife um, looked at John and said, John, would you pray for Mike? We're there in the coffee club. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm used to bowing my head and praying in coffee clubs. I'm not used to full-on prayer meetings. And he threw his arm around me, planted a hand on my forehead, and in a loud voice started calling on Jesus to come and bless me. And i got to tell you, it was the most natural and beautiful thing. And I was just so delighted to be there. And I don't know if everybody converted, thought we were all Fruit Loops or what. I don't really care. Because you know what happened? That guy is entangled with Jesus. And I just felt very much like I was sitting next to Jesus in the coffee club. And that's, I think, what Peter's trying to get at. To participate in the divine nature that when you're sitting with people in the coffee club... And this is not, this, you know, this sermon can go down. So I'm going to beat you all up now and tell you that if people do not feel like they're sitting with Jesus, you're really slack and you need to repent. Ah, the gift is given. It's yours and it's now. And already I'm here to tell you for every single one of you, there is something of that running through you. There is something of that running through you. You've seen it. You've known the times when people have said, how did you know that? What When you said that, I... You know, beautiful things, signs and wonders that have followed you. What Peter says to us this morning is, I messed up at the transfiguration. I'm not doing that again. I'm adding all those things and I am working on my spirituality. I am working on my discipleship that I might attain that prize. That's what I have to do. So I'm going to give you three hobbies this morning. Prayer, repentance and faith. It's you know, I nearly actually didn't preach anything this morning. I nearly got us into small groups and said, I need to know how your personality best prays. Because, you know, we're all different. The way I pray would not help you. The way you pray would be boring to me. Mm. But we've got to find our way. The way that I repent, you would probably look at me and think, you've got to do that much to get that little result? And I'd look at you and think, yeah, sure, that's never going to work. Right? What builds your faith makes me think, yeah, you're a fruit loop. What builds my faith, you think, is la-la land, right? We've got to do this road ourselves. And I am commending to you three hobbies, faith, prayer, and repentance. Work them out. That's what Peter's saying. And that's the royal road to your transfiguration. I hope that was some use to you. It's wonderful for me. I'm just enjoying this stuff at the moment. 
It's Transfiguration Sunday. Great day to give a yell and a shout for, you know, what John said. We do not yet know what we will look like in the future, but we will be like him. And in this life, I want to take St. Paul, St. Peter and St. John seriously. It's no longer I that live. When you meet me, the second coming has come a little early because I'm entangled with Jesus. And I want that to be what I meet when I meet you. Is it good? Let's pray. Oh God, this stuff is so hard to communicate, hard to even understand or receive. But Paul said, you know, that, that you might know the hope that you have, the power at work within you that raised Christ from the dead and the, the hope of glory that is all over you. These huge Bible words written to very ordinary, mundane people out there trying to pay their mortgages and in, in the early years trying to deal with the fact that everybody hated them. And yet it's true. It's obviously true. Lord, we've been doing this for 2,000 years. We can't shake it. So Lord, I want to pray that you would lift our faith to look at this transfiguration story and to know that there is spectacle, power, glory in us. And that you would speak to our minds and our hearts and our wills and give us the grace to do what Peter said. Do your utmost to own it.